God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bless thee, God, and now and The Lord be with you. And also with you. Jesus said, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of God over one sinner who repents. Let us pray. Almighty God, God to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord.
Almighty God, fountain of all goodness, we humbly pray, pray you to bless our sovereign Lord, King Charles, and all who govern us. May all things be ordered in wisdom, <coughs> righteousness, and peace. To the honour of your holy name, and the good of your church and people, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Will you please be seated? A reading from Exodus, chapter 32, verses 7 to 14. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, It was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants, descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he had planned to bring on his people. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalms 51, 1 to 10. Have mercy on me, O God, in your enduring goodness. According to the fullness of your compassion, blot out my offences. Wash me thy from our wickedness, and cleanse me from our sin. For I acknowledge my rebellion, and my sin is ever before me. A reading from the first letter of Paul to Timothy, chapter 1, verses 1 to 2 and 12 to 19a. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the command of God our Saviour and of Christ Jesus our Lord. To Timothy, my loyal child in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. 
The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. I am giving you these instructions, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies made earlier about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in the faith. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May my words be spoken and heard in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In some circles, a popular criticism of Christians and of religious people generally is that they prevent people enjoying life by having lots of rules and regulations. Don't do this. Don't do that. More often than not, that's an exaggeration. We read this in the book of Ecclesiastes. God has made everything beautiful in its time. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift. God has created us to enjoy the good things of life. In today's Gospel, Jesus is criticised not by the irreligious people, but by the religious people, Pharisees and scribes. They grumbled, not because he was enjoying himself and having a good time, but because of the company he was keeping. Tax collectors and sinners gathered around to listen to him. This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus replied to his critics by telling three parables, three stories, three cases of lost and found, a sheep, a coin, and a son. Each of them ends with a wild party to celebrate the recovery, recovery of that which was lost and now has been found. The view of the Christian life as a dreary, dull, joyless affair is a caricature. Jesus had a very active social life. Many of his parables portray the kingdom of heaven as a party. Remember the time when Jesus' critics came to him and said, The disciples of John the Baptist often fast and pray long prayers, but your disciples are always eating and drinking and partying. In other words, we can tell John's disciples are religious because they look so miserable, but yours seem to enjoy life and have fun. So Jesus tells these three stories to the scribes and Pharisees who accused him of welcoming sinners. We looked at the third one, the story of the lost son, the prodigal son, back in the season of Lent, and today's reading has the other two. Which of you... If he has, say, a hundred sheep, one wanders off, will not leave the ninety-nine sheep in the wilderness exposed, vulnerable to wolves, going astray, being exposed to all kinds of danger. Which of you would not go out and search until you found that one 
lost sheep. Then will you not carry that sheep home on your shoulders and call up all your friends and invite them to celebrate with you? Which of you would not do that? And which of you, if you are like a woman who's lost, say, a silver coin, in Greek it's a drachma, which is about a day's wage for a labourer, will not rip up all your living room carpet, move all the furniture out into the driveway, put the heavy appliances in the front garden, and then search until you've found the coin. Then, when she's found it, she comes running out into the yard and yells up and down the street shouting, you're all invited to drinks in my place at 6 p.m. No, make that 5 p.m. I've found my coin. Now, which one of you would not do that? Probably all the neighbours thought that she was, uh, had started her happy hour early. <laughs> the answer is none of us would do that. But this isn't about us. This is about God. These parables show up the difference between us and God. We would say, well, at least we have 99 sheep left. Not God. He goes looking for the one lost sheep. We say, well, at least we have nine coins left. God turns the house upside down and searches for the lost one. We have to have something really exciting to celebrate. God goes over the top for a seemingly insignificant sheep or coin. We feel more comfortable with those who never went astray. God doesn't give up until the lost sheep or the lost coin is found. He doesn't, keep, he doesn't give up waiting until the son returns home. Jesus said to the chief priests and elders, I tell you the truth, the tax collector, and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Jesus doesn't say, right, clean up your act, and then I might think of eating and celebrating with you. St. Paul says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God proves his love to us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for United Methodist Bishop Will Willimon tells how he went to a youth rally at 9pm on a Saturday night in Alabama with 500 screaming teenagers and a rock band. The sermon was delivered by Duffy Robbins. Uh, I don't know who that is, but I have heard the, uh, the name. Apparently he taught youth ministry at Asbury Seminary, which is a famous Wesleyan uh, seminary. The text was Romans 5. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And he told the audience that he needed their help for a little skit. He said, I need some volunteers to come out here onto the stage, and to my right, on this side of the stage, I want people to come out, and you will be all the righteous people. To the left of the stage are the bad, the unrighteous people. And when I call your name, and it won't be your name, it'll be the name of a famous person that you probably know about. Um, when I call your name, like you, you come out and stand where you think you belong on this continuum of the good and the bad. Okay, the first person is Mother Teresa. And somebody put their hand up, he said, yes, you, you come up here. And that person immediately went to uh, the right-hand side of the stage, Mother Teresa. The next one, okay, Martin Luther King Jr., come up here. And somebody came up, volunteered, and Mother Teresa welcomes Martin Luther King on the righteous side. Okay, next is John Wesley. Someone comes up. They're welcomed by Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King. Now, Genghis Khan. Okay, your Genghis Khan, you go to the left. Good. Joseph Stalin. There you go. You're standing there on the left. Next, Adolf Hitler. You come up here and stand on the left. Now this continued in, this, in that vein until there were about 20 kids, 20 teenagers on the stage. A little group on the right were the righteous. A little group on the left were the unrighteous. 
Duffy Robbins said, we need to call one more person up here. Jesus Christ. Yep, okay, you can be Jesus Christ. And a young woman came up. She was welcomed by Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, John Wesley. The audience was asked, is everybody happy? Have all these people, we've got them all in the right places? Everybody nodded. And Duffy Robbins said, do you people listen to anything? Let me read this text once again. Christ died for the unrighteous, for the ungodly, for the rebels. And then Jesus started to move across the stage, bit by bit, to the left. Does anyone here have the guts to go with Jesus? To walk into your school, your place of work, your family, and talk to the people he talked to, the people he died for? We are commissioned by our baptism to go in search for the lost. Rather than talk of us seeking God, finding God, going on a spiritual search, the Bible's view of things that it's God who is passionately, unrelentingly, unfailingly searching for us. It's been expressed like this, that the heart of the spiritual life is not so much finding God as allowing yourself to be found. Three parables about three individuals who go over the top in their search for a lost item or thing or person. Each time, Jesus asks, now which of you would not do the same? Which of you wouldn't leave the 99 sheep alone in the wilderness and go in search of the lost sheep? The answer is nobody. Leaving 99 to search for the one lost one is not economic rationalism, it's economic lunacy. You don't have to be very bright to work that out. We tend to think the parables are all about us. The shepherd here is God. This is not about instructions for shepherding. It's about God's priorities, which are usually out of kilter with ours. Christ died for the ungodly. Why would God bother to, church, to, to search for one lost soul? It makes far more sense to hang in there with the ones who remain faithful, who actually keep things going who haven't turned back or wandered off, but have stayed the course. When I was the cabin pastor at Christ Church Cathedral several years ago, one Sunday morning after the celebrations of the Eucharist, I had lunch with then diocesan bishop Greg Thompson, Greg Thompson and His Grace the Archbishop of Hong Kong, Most Reverend Paul Kwong. And the Archbishop's chaplain was a young priest with whom I enjoyed some very informative conversations. And I referred to the healthy growth of the Anglican Church in Hong Kong. He said, yes, the church is growing, but they're finding that many people don't stay the course. New people are coming into the church, but not all of them stay. So they're exploring strategies to deal with that. I got to thinking how once people are baptized and or confirmed, they're often then left to their own devices. When parents of newborn babies leave the hospital with their new little bundle of joy, they don't take it home and so say, okay, bub, you're on your own now. They have a vulnerable <coughs> little life that will need nurturing and caring and caring for and feeding and clothing and changing until he or she is able to do that for him or herself. God goes looking for the one that wanders off. I reflect on, as a parent, how ridiculous it would have been when my children were small and one of them wandered off and we said, oh, that's okay, we've still got two left. <laughs> what parent would ever do that? God doesn't sit in heaven with his arms folded, waiting for us to come to our senses and to finally do the right thing. He comes actively searching for us. Each finding of that which was lost ends in a party, a celebration. When we gather for the Eucharist, we are celebrating the fact 
that we were all, all of us, lost at one time. But God came searching, and here we are, sitting at his table at his invitation. Let us together affirm the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was in mind of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he came through you. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. Amen. On the third day he rose again in the Lord of the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look at the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for God's world and for God's church. Loving God, we give you thanks that when we wander far from you, you lead us back to your way of truth. Look in mercy on your world. We pray for the peoples of the world, for victims of cruel political regimes or unjust social systems, for all who suffer because of our ignorance or indifference, for the leaders of nations and for all who exercise responsibility. Teach us to live in harmony with one another. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks that you come to find us not in anger, but with outstretched arms. Look in mercy on your church. We pray for your holy Catholic church, for leaders of churches, for priests and ministers, for chaplains, youth workers, pastoral visitors, for all in this parish who bring you bring your love to others. Teach us together to share your good news in the world. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks that you have shown us the ways of love and acceptance. Look in mercy on our community. We pray for all with whom we share our lives, for our families, our friends, and those with whom we work, for the hungry and homeless of this community, for those who have been stripped of their dignity and hope. Teach us to be a, a community where love and care our found. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks that you seek out the lost and care for the lonely, the weak and the despised. Look in mercy on those who suffer. We pray for all who are in need, for those in places of fear, loneliness, grief or pain, for those whose minds are troubled, whose spirits are sad, whose bodies hurt, for the sick and the dying, those whom you know, and those known only to you. Teach us to bring tenderness and comfort to your people. God of mercy, hear our prayer. 
Almighty God, we give you thanks that you are ever ready to receive your children, rejoicing to welcome us from death to life. Look in mercy on those who have died. We give you thanks for your faithful people of every age, those who have gone before and those who have taught us the way of faith. May we, through these and all your saints, come home to find our place with you and join with you in the heavenly feast you prepared for all who love you. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayer. Grant that what we have asked in prayer, we may by your grace receive, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are the body of Christ. His spirit is with us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty, our joy, and our salvation that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. For he is the true High Priest, who has freed us from our sins and made us a royal priesthood to serve you, our God and Father. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying,
for we will share the divine bread.
bountiful God, at this table you graciously feed us with the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. May we who have reached out our hands to receive this sacrament be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises, tell of your glory and truth in our lives. We who have seen the greatness of your love, see you face to face in your kingdom, and come to worship you with all your saints forever. Most loving God, you send us into the world you love. Give us grace to go thankfully and with courage in the power of your Spirit.